the brass band phenomenon became very, very popular all through America because just as there were black musicians who left the military after um, the Civil War and um, uh, carried on uh, with their um, uh, private uh, ventures um, as cohesive units or working with each other in other types of units, uh, just kind of gigging, so to speak. Um, the same was true of the white units. So you had a lot of brass bands, black and white. And in this early period, around 1900, you quite often had a mixture of uh, integrated uh, bands, especially around New Orleans, where you had uh, what they call Creoles of color. These are people who, let's just say, outward appearance could make them mistaken for white. So if challenged by a segregationist, you could say, well, he's actually a Mexican or he's actually a Cuban or whatever. Um, uh, things are not as rigid as they later became, as they later became, which brings up uh, something that took place about the same time, which was Plessy versus Ferguson. Legalized segregation. Uh, Supreme Court, um, 1896. That changed things. And uh, it didn't matter if you looked like a Mexican anymore. You, you weren't quite dark enough if you were not white. Uh, so we had our all black bands. And fortunately, around New Orleans, whose black population had doubled between 1860 and 1880, you had a lot of uh, different um, uh, societies there, secret societies, fraternal societies, religious societies, uh, etc. Uh, Freemasons, odd fellows, uh, you name it. Um, and uh, the estimate is there were over 225 of these organizations working in New Orleans around this time, and their chief uh, uh, purpose was to have events that uh, entertain the people and raise money for their benevolent um, uh, uh, pursuits. One of the earliest bands uh, to emerge as a uh, professional band, separate from military, and a cohesive unit was a band from uh, the other side of the river from New Orleans, Algiers. Algiers historically had been uh, the area where slaves were held and sold and et cetera. And it is also known for its hoodoo and voodoo which means uh, a lot of people didn't mess around in Algiers because they were afraid of being turned into a chicken or a dog or something. Algiers was, um, was a pretty interesting place, but you had this band called the Pickwick Brass Band. 10, 12 people from Algiers who stayed together and formed that brass band, and they paid for a lot of these social events, whether they were parades or picnics or dances or balls or political rallies or fundraising events or even church events sometime. Um, uh, they were formed in 1873. They lasted uh, somewhere to around 1900. And um, one of their uh, most esteemed members was uh, Professor James Brown Humphrey. Yeah, Professor Humphrey. And uh, they're not necessarily playing jazz, they're playing um, more formal music, uh, you know, um, more Europeanish music. Um, not a lot of, uh, of uh, blues, but some ragtime and uh, popular songs and that kind of thing, what we call polite music. Uh, they were not of the body Bolden type. However, the essential thing here is that Professor Humphrey traveled at his own expense by train all over the backwoods of Louisiana to plantations teaching kids to play music. And a lot of the musicians to emerge in later years in brass bands, in da dance orchestras, playing in story viola as a part of the new emerging jazz music were people who had been taught by Professor Humphreys. So the Pickwick 
jazz band, the Pickwick Brass Band, was a very important and pivotal organization in the early history of New Orleans and the black brass band movement in that area. Once again, Pickwick Brass Band. Thank you.